In 1972, our founder, Dr. Eric Klinghammer of Purdue University, had a dream that he could make a place where researchers and the public who were interested in wolves could come and observe wolves in an environment that allowed them to use many of their normal wolf-like behaviors, even though they were in captivity. These, of course, would be primarily social behaviors, and also when they hunted, it would be primarily small prey. His idea was that if we could reach enough people, we could help preserve our remaining population of gray wolves in the United States, and also preserve our remaining wilderness areas, which are where they need to live, because at this point in our mutual history, wolves and humans tend to come into conflict when they live close together. And uh, when you keep non-domestic animals in captivity, you have to adapt to them. I'd like to make some generalizations about domestic and non-domestic animals. Domestic animals have a series of traits that allow them to live with us more easily than wild animals do. A lot of people assume that if a wild animal is in captivity, and especially if it's tame, that it has been domesticated. We tend to use the terms tame and domesticated as if they were interchangeable, but actually they're separate, though often complementary processes. Uh, taming is something that's done to animals within their own lifetime, individual by individual. Domestication is something that occurs to a population of animals, typically one that lives with or close to humans, over many generations, and as the generations pass, pass, this domestication process changes them at the genetic level. Domestic animals have a complex of characteristics that add up to what we call tractability. They're easier to keep, easier to work with. Wild animals, even in captivity, retain survival adaptations, and that makes it harder for them to live in close proximity with us harder for us to work with them quite often, and so we have to get good at adapting to them. When we try to figure out how to adapt to wolves, we use the concept of the umwelt. The umwelt is the animal's perceptual surround, but it's much more than their senses, like sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste, and maybe for some species, some perception of the magnetic fields of Earth. It includes those, but it's much more. It also includes the animal's evolutionary history, what species it belongs to, what species it comes from, and its own individual history from conception up to the current moment. The Cuban proverb, inside every head a world, sums up the Umwelt concept pretty nicely. Well, I know of a few instances where wolves were taken directly from the wild and brought into captivity and they adjusted well or fairly well. This is usually difficult, uh, especially if a wolf is taken into captivity as an adult. So today, except for uh, breeding projects aimed at reintroducing the Mexican gray wolf, Canis lupus bailei, and the red wolf, Canis rufus, a different species, uh, it, back into parts of their historical range, the government generally does, uh, does not look with approval on taking wild wolves into captivity. Therefore, Wolf Park works with wolves that were born in zoos or other reputable facilities, and we sometimes breed our own, we sometimes bring animals in from other facilities so that our line does not get too inbred. When you're keeping non-domestic animals in captivity, historically, one of the first big challenges for any, I'll call them zookeepers for simplicity, one of the zookeepers' first big challenges is coming up with a diet that will keep their charges healthy and preferably able to reproduce in captivity. But, and I'll come back to this, there's more to feeding than simple nutrition, although I know nutrition is not simple. Then there's the matter of shelter, oops. Major oops. Uh, 
Um, thank you. For wolves, for most of the year, their fur coats are their shelters and sometimes the leeward side of large windproof objects. But in spring, when the females are whelping, they often want to make dens, and some males show a desire to make dens at this time, too. Our wolves are provided with man-made shelters, but as you can see from this picture, they also have enclosures where they can make their own dens if they want to. This is Dharma, and she is in a renovated muskrat tunnel, which uh, now several genera generations of females have renovated and enlarged into a den where uh, they prefer to whelp. Beyond food and shelter, captive uh, animals, captive wild animals, in our case wolves, have to uh, live in close proximity to humans and other scary things. Not just the size of the enclosure, but also its shape can affect whether or not the animals can get far enough away from potentially dangerous, probably scary things in order to feel safe or not. In other words, an enclosure, two enclosures that have the same number of square yards uh, may be very different in how the animals perceive them. Some enclosures may allow the animals to feel safe, while others keep them uh, permanently in close proximity to things that frighten them and put them under stress. Uh, another challenge that zookeepers face is that of unintended domestication. My personal belief about this is it stems from our species' well-known fondness for the easy path. We like to find the simple way of making things work. So if you keep a captive population of wild animals, you're going to notice that some are just easier to work with. They do well on the food that you can provide them with a reasonable, reasonable amount of effort. They're a little easier to work with. They're less inclined to bite, stomp, kick, or gore you. And they may reproduce a little better. Even if you don't intend this, those animals tend to thrive a little bit more, and sometimes people do deliberately give them some help. And so over time, these more tractable non-domestic animals uh, have more and more descendants in the next generation. And so they tend to outkeep, compete uh, their relatives who are less tractable. Uh, and this starts them down the path to domestication. At Wolf Park, we made a conscious decision that we were going to keep difficult wolves uh, in our population, and though there's no guarantee that they will reproduce, the wolves have a lot of say in this, uh, and just because one wolf is a male and one wolf is a female does not going to mean that they are going to get together and produce puppies. Sometimes the answer is no, not even if you were the last wolf on earth. Get away, you're icky. <laughs> but there is the possibility that these difficult animals or more challenging animals will leave descendants in our population. In response to humans, uh, wolves tend to fall into four categories, and of course there are a lot more characteristics to their personality than this, but you often see this in their flight distance or how close they're willing to come to humans. Some wolves have a high interest in humans and a low fear. For whatever reason, they act as if we are somewhat intrinsically interesting and they like to come close. These are not necessarily easy wolves to work with. They may decide to chase you out of the enclosure. Other wolves have a high interest in people, but also a pretty high fear, and they show a lot of approach avoidance conflict, coming close and retreating, coming close and retreating. Other wolves have a low fear of humans, but they also don't seem to find us very interesting. Their attitude towards humans can be described as meh. And then there are the ones with a high fear in, of humans and a low interest, and given the opportunity, they will be over the horizon. All four types can be worked with, and we can have a great influence in how they react to us as adults by the kind of early experience we, have, we give them starting when they are little infants. We socialize our wolves. Uh, a tame wolf or a tame animal is one that has a flight distance from humans that is zero. It may come all the way up to you. It may yet let you come up to it. Notice I didn't say it's necessarily safe or friendly to do this. 
But if the wolves are socialized to humans, treat humans as a part of their social community, this reduces their stress at being in closer proximity to humans than most wild wolves would choose. So medical care is easier on the wolves, on us, and on our veterinarian. This young wolf, it's actually the same individual as the one in the previous picture. Uh, his name is Bicho, by the way. And he is getting eye drops, uh, part of post-operative care for juvenile cataract surgery, which he had when he was seven months old. He and his brother both had their opaque uh, cataract-covered lenses removed and artificial lenses put in again, and voila, they could see. Uh, but post-operative care meant that they had eye drops put in their eyes for months afterwards, every day. In the beginning, several times a day. This would have been extremely difficult, possibly impossible, if they had not been hand-raised. Uh, so whether it's a matter of routine husbandry or crisis or an outright emergency, uh, having the wolves socialized to humans and trusting them means that we can do a lot more with them and for them. It also offers expanded opportunities for enrichment. Uh, in the phrase from Wind in the Willows, sometimes that's messing about in boats. I'd like to point out that I'm going to experiment here. There's the clicker. This is their mother. Uh, this is her litter of six puppies, and they're having family day at the beach. When we do enrichment for them, some enrichment is designed to elicit behaviors that they would find useful in the wild. And some purists in this matter of enrichment for captive wild animals insist that should be the only kind. But we find it's beneficial for the wolves and for us if we sometimes do something that uh, wild wolves would never have a chance to do. It also helps us with research. Well, some of our research, and especially in the beginning, uh, was primarily observational and non-invasive. We now do projects, either of our own, or we host other researchers who come and study our wolves. Uh, and some of these uh, projects require that the wolves interact with the experimenters, uh, use uh, or tolerate various kinds of equipment. These two pictures are part of a project that we are working on. We're helping a California-based research group. They are studying energy budgets of large predators. Currently, they have been studying cougars this winter. Uh, the wolf researcher collared wild wolves in Denali, and the collars that he was using uh, have been calibrated, and this is still an ongoing project uh, at Wolf Park so that they can correctly interpret the data that the accelerometers are sending back to them. They combine GPS units and accelerometers on these collars. Uh, and one of the things we tested out was, will these collars be comfortable for the wolves? The wolves decided they needed some bling. Collars were not a problem. Uh, other phases of the project involve gating on a treadmill. I said I'd come back to feeding and that there's more to giving food to animals than simple nutrition. We feed our wolves a lot of road-killed white-tailed deer. This is one of their natural prey species. But besides the balanced diet that comes from eating a whole carcass, they get more opportunity to make choices about who will eat first, what parts of the carcass they want, if you're interested, uh, most of the time, wolves seem to prefer muscle meat. And uh, sometimes we have butchered carcasses and given them only the organs. And their reaction after several meals like this is kind of like, guts again. So, but they do want guts from time to time. Also, having access to the bones and the hide with the hair on them promotes good oral hygiene. They brush and floss equivalent. And they get more exercise dissecting a large carcass like this than they would by wolfing down small portions of individually measured zoo chow. By the way, we do have a backup supply of zoo chow in case we run out of roadkill deer, but we also have a walk-in freezer and cooler, so we don't run out very often. 
Leftovers can sometimes be recycled by the wolves as toys. Uh, we spend a lot of time not just studying wolves as a species, but studying our wolves individually. And a lot of this is done through interactions and keeping journals or databases on their behavior when they're with us. Uh, every time we interact with the wolves, we're adding to this interaction history. They keep databases on us, too, uh, inside their heads. They keep memories of what we do with them and for them. And as I mentioned, when there's a crisis or an emergency, uh, OK, we can have the next one, I think. Uh, these relationships based on trust. <laughs> uh, yes, we do sometimes joke it would be nice to have a literacy program for wolves there, but it hasn't gotten very far. Uh, we read them. They read us. They also read each other. And when we're working with them, we have to uh, be aware that not only are they interacting with us, we have to be aware that they may need or want to respond to something that another wolf is doing. So we do a lot of trying to balance being in the moment, concentrating on the wolf that you're working with, but also being aware of the bigger picture. OK, if we could have the next. Thank you. How we do this, we start when the puppies are little infants before they're weaned. We take them at 10 to 14 days of age. People sometimes ask, well, if your wolves are so well socialized, why can't you leave them with the mother and just handle them uh, daily while they're growing up? Uh, wolves are not dogs. We can do this with dogs, and we do. Wolf puppies and dog puppies are both born hardwired to recognize real adult canines as opposed to human foster relatives. In dogs, a preference for real adult canines has been relaxed. In wolves, this preference has not been relaxed. So the only way we've found to compete with it successfully is to take the puppies away when they're less than 21 days old. And if we get them at 10 to 14 days, they seem to adjust to nursing from a bottle better. Uh, and from that time until they're 16 weeks, four months old, uh, they are with us. Next, please. That doesn't mean that they're completely isolated from the adults, but it does mean that in their first summer, most of their wolf-to-wolf -wolf interactions are from their fellow puppies. They have visits from the adults. Some of the adults are co comfortable coming into the nursery. Uh, and the puppies also have uh, carefully supervised field trips into the enclosures with the adults where they're going to be living as adults themselves. And uh, these show puppies. Uh, with no, uh, various adults. The two bottom pictures are puppies with a female. Uh, she's not the biological mother of all those puppies, but she was a wonderful auntie or grandma. And up on top, that is a male. We've had some males who, uh, male wolves tend to show strong parental or uncle-ish or big brother-ish behavior and uh, uh, want to be with the puppies. During the time they're with us, uh, we try to give them about 2,000 hours of human contact. If you're trying to calculate how this works out, uh, it may be a little confusing. So see me during a break if you want an explanation. And we also introduce a lot of novel items, substrates, experiences into their environment before the onset of a sensitive period that is often called the fear period. However. Uh, it's possible that if we do a good job of introducing enough things into their environment, things that they may encounter later as older animals, uh, adolescents or adults, uh, that they will cope with them much better than if they first see them after they're past this, uh, this critical period for accepting new things calmly. And of course, at this age, puppies are also very interested in helping with research and can be employed as page turners. During this time, we also work on useful life skills. Walking on a leash is one of them. It can be a wolf's key to the wider world. It enables us to move them to some of our fenced in fields so that they can free run there under supervision for a while. And for 30 years, we did a wolf bison demonstration where we would put some of our wolves in with our herd of North American Plains bison and let them go through the first stage of a hunt, which involves testing. I should mention that uh, we know how to balance the risks, and the wolves uh, never killed, uh, killed a bison or a seriously injured one. Uh, we also work on uh, 
socialization to humans and the adult wolves provide socialization to other wolves. Our rule of thumb is that we need to know what puppy behavior is going to grow into as adults. If something is not going to be a behavior, is not going to be cute and safe when it's done by an adult, it's not going to be cute and safe in a puppy. And we have to take uh, means to make sure that we don't let them practice bad behavior. We use a lot of operant and classical conditioning to promote good behavior. Uh, over the course of a lifetime, uh, we are always building our interaction histories with the wolves and they keep, as I said, databases on us. They remember things that we do with them and for them. And uh, we think that this enhances their life in captivity. We see part of their function as animal ambassadors from their species to ours, but they don't understand this. They were roped into it without giving conformed consent. So it behooves us to make sure that they have as rich and varied and satisfying a life in captivity as possible. And I'd like to wind up with a word of thanks to our founder, Dr. Eric Klinghammer, and to his uh, friend and mentor, Conrad Lorenz, who was a Nobel Prize winning ethologist. Both men worked with non-domestic animals. Uh, Lorenz worked with quite a few species, but he's probably best known for his work with gray lag geese. Uh, Dr. Klinghammer worked with wolves. And they both uh, worked with socialized captive animals. We know that our presence affects the wolves' behavior, but the way we raise them, our presence affects them more like another wolf, another member of the social group, rather than the way the human presence often affects uh, wild wolves or wild geese when humans try to approach them. Uh, in their own habitats. Uh, again, thank you for having me here, uh, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation.